You know, teaching chemistry can really be a gas. We're going to do a gas experiment right here using this air duster. It says for dusting computers, office equipment, home electronics, photo equipment. Hmm, multi-purpose. Well, my question is, what's inside the can? What is this compressed gas? So we're going to do a couple of calculations, first using the ideal gas law, and then coordinating this with an empirical formula calculation. We're going to calculate a molar mass, put it together with an empirical mass, and determine the identity of this gas. All right, here we go. The first thing we're going to do is take this gas and mass it on the balance. I need to turn the balance on, let it zero. Starting mass of the gas is 290.408 grams. 290.408 grams. We have Lance from Wisconsin serving as my able-bodied assistant. Come on over, Lance. All right, now what we're going to do, I want you to hold the graduated cylinder, raise it, but keep the cylinder beneath the surface of the liquid. Now what I'm going to do is try to collect, I'm going to turn this around from, for my benefit here. Mm, get a good angle here. All right, that's great. Down just a little bit. I don't want to lose anything here. Okay, here we go. We're going to collect as close to 250 milliliters as possible. We need a lot of gas. Gas doesn't have a lot of mass. Mm, particles are too far apart. Here we go. It's important that all of it goes up into the graduated cylinder, so I'm trying to get this positioned well. That's good. All right. Here we go. Don't get it above the surface of the liquid. Keep it down. I'm good. Fine. Okay. Pretty close. A little bit more. Oh, maybe. I don't want to risk it. I'm going to stop right there. Okay. Back to the board, Lance, and thank you. The next thing I need to do is read the volume of the gas collected. And I'm going to try this by raising the graduated cylinder until the water levels inside the tube are the same as the water levels outside the tube. It's a little bit more than 240 milliliters. I'm going to say 244 milliliters of gas was collected. That's the total volume of gas being collected there. Lance is recording this on the board. I want to take the temperature of the water. I tested it earlier and it's gone up just a little bit. The temperature at this point is about 27.2 point, 27 degrees Celsius. I have 27 on the board. Um, if you want to make that 27, no, un, uh, sorry, under te uh, my fault, under temperature, um, 27.2 degrees Celsius, and then we'll change it to Kelvin, and that would be 300 0.2 degree, uh, Kelvin, 300.2 Kelvin. All right, so we've got our temperature of the water, which would be the temperature of the water both in the uh, uh, large beaker and in our graduated cylinder. The last thing we need to do then is to take the final mass of our air duster. Lance, I need you to record 289 point seven four four. All right. A quick calculation. The difference uh, in the mass is going to be point six six four grams. Okay. I think I've got all the data that I need recorded on the board now. So, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to move over to the board for a second. And 
some information is being given. You're going to stay with me, okay, just on that side. We're being told that the composition of this gas is 36.4% carbon, 57.6% fluorine, and 6% hydrogen. Well, we can take these and turn these into grams. So I'm going to say that it's 36.4 grams of carbon. Lance, if you'll just put grams right there for me. I'm assuming that I, if I had a 100 gram sample, that those percentages could be converted into grams. So 36.4 grams of carbon, 57.6 grams of fluorine, and 6 grams of hydrogen. In order to calculate an empirical formula, I want to go to moles. And so I've done this calculation already, saying that for every 12 grams of carbon, there's one mole of carbon. So doing the math, I would get 3.03 moles of carbon, 57.6 grams of fluorine. Well, there's 19 grams in one mole of fluorine, so that would give me 3.03 moles of fluorine. And the 6 grams of hydrogen, one gram of hydrogen is one mole, that would give me six moles. So I've done a mole calculation first, and then to find the empirical formula, I would divide all of these moles by the smallest number in order to get the smallest whole number ratio. That's what an empirical formula is going to tell me. So dividing by hmm, 3.03 is my smallest number. If I divide all of these by that number, I'm going to get a ratio of 1 to 1 to 2. 1 carbon, 1 fluorine, 2 hydrogens. My empirical formula then would be CFH2. And I could calculate, using the periodic table, the mass the empirical mass. I've done this already. 12 for the carbon, 19 for the fluorine, 2 grams for each of the hydrogens, well, for the total hydrogens. That would give me a total of 33 grams, which I've moved here. This is my empirical mass. Now, let's calculate from our collected data the molar mass. All right, we're going to come right here and let's put up our equation. Our pressure first, Lance, we're going to write in 0.99 atmospheres. Okay, for our volume, well, I know what value I'm going to use for the universal gas law constant, so I'm going to change this into liters, and so we're going to put in parentheses the volume as 0.244 liters. I'm going to solve for N, so let's say equals N. R is going to be 0 0.0821. We're not going to write it on the board, but it's going to be in units of atmosphere liters per mole Kelvin. That's the units for this value for the universal gas law constant. And then our temperature must be in Kelvin, so we're going to put in 300.2 degrees Kelvin. I'm going to solve for N. Lance, if you'll just write equals N. Okay, I get this value. 0.0098. .0098 moles. All right, so if I have that many moles, what I really want to do is find the molar mass. And I know that moles is, uh, is going to be, um, mass over the molar mass is going to give me a, a mole calculation. So if I were to take this number and divide it by, let me see, by the mass, no, take the mass. So let's take the mass here, give me a small m for mass. Divide it by N. All right, so this would be 0 0.0098. Nope, my fault. Mass is, whoops, 0.664 grams. My fault. 0.664 grams divided by the number of moles, which is 0 0.0098. I'm going to just pull up that answer. And I get, for my value, 
uh, 67.7. Sixty-seven point seven grams then per mole. Mass over moles, grams per mole. That's my molar mass. So we're going to take this number, sixty-seven point seven, put it in here for the molar mass. Lance, thank you. All right, what have we got here then? If we take the molar mass of sixty-seven point seven grams, divide it by the empirical mass. I'm not even going to bother to do that on my calculator. I know there's a little bit of experimental error here. Something I really haven't taken into account in my calculations would be the water vapor pressure at this temperature, which would make small differences in my calculations. But just by doubling 33, that's going to give me about 66. This looks like almost a 2 to 1 ratio. 2 to 1. So this tells me that this empirical formula does not exist, what it actually exists is something with twice that mass. And so my molecular formula would be C2, F2, H4. You know, that's very logical to me. If I think about this, I'm not real happy saying that this empirical formula would exist. I think of carbon wanting to form four bonds, and I only see three bonds to a central carbon atom here if the fluorine and the hydrogens are on the outside of the molecule. So that wouldn't make sense that it would be a molecular formula. But if I have C2H4, and I'm thinking I'm just going to use this little bit of space that's left, I make good use of my board, don't I? If I have the two carbons here in the center, and then I need in order for the carbons to each have four bonds, I need six attachments. And I have one, two, and four more for a total of six atoms that would be attached to the two central carbons. Now, I really don't know what, uh, where the fluorines and the hydrogens would be located from the work that I've done, but I could still name this compound. It would be an ethane derivative because of the two carbons. It would have two fluorines. It would be a difluoroethane of some sort. Let's take a look. The contents on the um, propellants can vary. Some of these are um, monofluoroethanes and some are difluoroethanes. Let me see. This one says contents difluoroethane. Not bad. The calculations are a little fast and a little crude, but when you can take and use a very small sample, collect your data quickly, and relate your gas laws, the ideal gas law, to something you've probably done previously in your classroom. Using the periodic table, doing mole calculations, using empirical formulas. I like putting the chemistry together, and I like having my students go over in class the skills that they've already developed. I don't want them to forget what they learned yesterday.